experts have weighed in on the status of today's internet, and the results are, you might not be surprised, not the prettiest. Mozilla's 2019 Internet Health Report analyzes the internet's impact on society and our everyday lives. It's the third year Mozilla has published the report. This year they focused on privacy and artificial intelligence. Mark Sermon joins us now to talk about the report. He's the executive director at the Mozilla Foundation. Good to have you here. Good morning. Good morning. I love them blue glasses. Thank you. Uh, okay, so so let's talk about last year you were talking, it was Cambridge Analytica, right? And the thought of, oh no, they're giving away our data. What are they doing with it? Yeah, it's it? like, holy moly, what yeah, just happened? Right. That was last year. So this year's focus was what? This year's focus is really, I think, twofold. One, there's still a lot about privacy, but as we get into this world of artificial intelligence, what does it mean to have all our data sucked back up and spat back at us. And so, you know, you see that showing up in ways that you might not even think about as artificial intelligence. Tell the folks what you were telling me about Facebook's profits. Well, I think one of the pieces is you've had this backlash. You've had people wake up and say privacy is a mainstream concern. But so what? I mean, we're all still using Facebook. Right. And this week it's expected to come out that Facebook's profits will actually drop for the first time since 2015. And you think that's because of? Well, it's a question is, are there repercussions for losing our trust, for not standing up for our privacy? And you know, we saw this with the environment over the last 30, 40 years, where companies are starting to talk about a double bottom line. So what's the double bottom line for the attention economy? What do we expect in terms of companies making a profit, that's their job, but also respecting our privacy? There was some information about the algorithm algorithms that companies use uh, to keep people online. How do they do that and is there a way that we can avoid that? Well, I guess the, you know, how do, we, how do they do it and also what are the repercussions? And you might not have seen a connection between these two things, but yesterday LA announced that there's a measles outbreak. Okay. You've got that in 22 states across the US. And you know, you can't blame the tech companies for measles, but what those algorithms, the ones that recommend videos on YouTube, that recommend articles on Facebook do, is try to keep you on the site as long as possible to see as many ads as possible. So what they're gonna do is put in front of you, recommend the most sensational content. That's what the AI is trained to do. And so things like anti-vax conspiracy theories or radical political content tend to keep people on a site longer. So is there a connection? Certainly the spread of misinformation that's anti-vax, don't vaccinate your kids, has been huge. And these AIs and the business model of the sites have certainly played some contributing role in amplifying that. All right, can we go back to what you just had on the screen right there, Control Room? Because it's a little confusing reading and listening to him. So, so I want to read some of what you had there. So how YouTube algorithms push viewers to extremist videos, recommendations drive more than 70% exactly. of the site's viewing time, yeah. looks for clips that data show are already drawing high traffic, and a majority of videos lead to extreme clips on the third recommendation. Yeah, and so you know what happens is you do, they're going... You go there looking for health information about your kids and you end up watching anti-vax information. Now, I'll say one of the things that's different about this year is people are speaking up and companies are starting to respond. YouTube has taken specifically anti-vax clips out of its recommendation engine, but it's done that manually. And the AI is still looking for that extreme content to keep you on the site. Does your report detail how companies around the world are starting to clamp down? on access to social media, right? So we're always like, we gotta fix it, fix it, bad, bad, bad. But some countries are saying, okay, we believe it's so bad that we're not gonna allow you to send that tweet. Or it might take you three hours to get the tweet out. Well, it's never the, the three hours. What it is is companies, or countries like Germany, are leaning on the, the companies to do the censorship for them. Now, part of this is good. We don't want this hateful content out there. Right. And there is illegal content, and we've gotta find a way to balance that out. But when you just sort of really say within an hour, you better take it down, as the U EU has said, you may have censorship that is stopping freedom of speech. So look at this Network Enforcement Act passed in Germany exactly. in 2018. It fines social media companies for not taking down unlawful content. That's interesting. Yeah, and the EU wow. is just about to pass something similar for the whole of Europe. And so do we really want to leave that censorship function in the hands of those companies and in the hands of automation? We've got to balance legitimate free speech and you know the kind of content that is causing harm. Well, I mean, you look at what just happened in Sri Lanka, right? So they cut down on the spread of misinformation by blocking access to sites, but that therefore prevents people from saying, hey mom, I'm okay, or are you okay, or, or meet me here. And that's the ultimate thing with the, what is the health of the internet? I mean, we think of the internet as you know, like a digital environment, just like the planet. It can be healthy, it can be unhealthy. And we've got to find that balance, right? We've got to look at the spread of content that is harmful, 
uh, you know, issues around privacy, but also free speech is a part of this and us connecting to our families is a part of this. The producers are telling me get to artificial intelligence and the bias involved with it. Well, you know, one of the things that people probably don't notice, although we're starting to hear about in the press, artificial intelligence is the inside of almost everything we're doing. And it, it's a funny term because it just means we're automating how things are happening. So what video you watch on YouTube, you know, the process of screening people for jobs, sometimes how the police allocate resources. It, but but it, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Is AI what I see when I go Google, I don't know, a pair of shoes that I like, and next thing I know on Facebook it pops up those shoes I looked at? Is it, that AI? That's big data and AI. So okay. it's looking at okay. all of the stuff you do, it's tracking you everywhere, and then it's having machines look at what to send to you, and it's selling mm. that to somebody. It's selling it to someone. Of course. I mean, how do you think those ads get there is, you know, people take that data and they target it at you. And that may be fine. Like, maybe you wanted those pair of shoes. I bought shoes that have been recommended to me that I love. But on the other hand, maybe you're somebody who's broke and you're going to target a payday loan at you. That's the kind of bias that you start seeing emerging in some of these AI systems. Wow. Mark, interesting <laughs> conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.